Hello and welcome to The Things You Thought You Knew, the A-Level Philosophy Podcast. I am your host, Brian Little, and before I begin this week's episode, I want to quickly apologise for two things. Firstly, there was no re- there was no episode released last week. I'm really sorry about that. I was struggling to get this week's episode edited in time, and I just couldn't do it. Um, secondly, I want to apologise a little bit, as when I recorded this episode of Benjamin Jones, I wasn't exactly on the top of the ball. I wanted to release the episode anyway, because Benjamin Jones did an excellent job. Uh, so I'm really sorry if I'm, my voice is a bit sore in this episode. It, it was a bit of a difficult one to record. I hope you will enjoy it anyway and you find it educational. Hello and welcome to The Things You Thought You Knew, the A-Level Philosophy Podcast. Today I'm joined by Benjamin Jones. Hi, Benjamin. Hi, uh, yeah. How are you today? Uh, yeah, all right. Hot. <laughs> um, other than that, yeah, fine. <laughs> so before we get into issues with the tripartite view of knowledge... Do you want to briefly explain how you got into philosophy and what you're doing at the moment? Yeah, um, I I didn't actually study it for a long time. I uh, but I, I didn't study it at college or anything like that. I got into it uh, by accident. I'd I'd taken a year out of college to be a rock star, um, right. and th- that wasn't turning out well. So I thought I'd go to university. <laughs> um, and um, when I was applying for courses, I, I applied for a whole bunch of different things. And my brother actually said to me, "You might like philosophy. Give it a go." And I got accepted. That was a that was a Birmingham. Um, they accepted me onto the onto the course, and I kind of haven't been off it since. Um, went back and did my masters while I was working. Sort of got a job as a philosophy teacher. Went back and did my masters. There was a flirtation with a PhD at one point, which never transpired. But yeah, that's it's just one of those things that sort of got its claws into me and didn't quite leave after that. Right, and what are you doing at the, at the moment related to philosophy? Um, at the moment, I'm just teaching A-level. I'm teaching A-level here in the Black Country. Um, so I, I taught it for about 10 years, and then due to uh, circumstances, I ended up um, just changing jobs for a while while I lived somewhere different. And, uh, and ended up teaching sociology and, and psychology there for a bit, but then came back to philosophy a couple of years ago. Um, still, as I mentioned, the PhD is still <laughs> dr- drumming through ideas for a PhD in my head that maybe one day will transpire. But other than that, that is my, that is my main thing that I do in, in philosophy now. Best of luck with the PhD. Uh, the other you. question I had for you was, what's your favourite part of philosophy? What interests you the most? I think that the the bits that I enjoyed the most about philosophy, I mean, the one side of it is just the engagement in it. So doing philosophy rather than just reading about it. So actually enjoying engaging normally with somebody else, trying to figure out a a problem, not necessarily arguing and trying to prove they're wrong, but which is something that we're incredibly guilty of in philosophy. But um but but actually engaging in a discussion and trying to figure things out is something. And I also um love political philosophy i think it's you know in some people's mind it's one of the soft philosophies along with ethics and things like that but um it's the, it's one way you can see the biggest impact in in the way people live and the way people do things um there's almost like a a relationship between us thinking about politics and sometimes changing the way that we behave and so that's always very exciting for me is kind of seeing how politics um, and political theory has shaped the world as much as just individual political actions i suppose so that's always kind of historically but also in the present really interesting right i've not actually looked much into political philosophy myself but i've looked briefly Mm. into it and it seems really interesting from what i've seen Uh, how would you advise someone gets into political philosophy if they've not studied it before I, th- I think with political philosophy, there's so much going on in it. It's like, you know, how do you get somebody into epistemology or, right. or, or something like that, or philosophy of language? And I think there are there are some great introductory texts out there that you could use. I think um, there are, are lots of companions, lots of just, you know, getting into political philosophy books out there that will just normally cover things topic by topic. Normally the, the way that I say to approach these things is if you get one of these sort of very broad topic by topic books, 
um, you will notice the bits that you find the most interesting and engaging. And you'll also find the philosophers that you find the most interesting and engaging. Um, the ones that you agree with and also the ones that make your blood boil because you really don't agree with them. Yeah. Um, and those are the people to go for. Those are the, the, the uh, you know, so as much as you might read Karl Marx and think that he's incredible, yes, go and read Karl Marx, but you're probably going to read Robert Nozick and he's going to send you nuts, um, in which case read Robert Nozick. You know, the, that's you should also be reading the people you disagree with. So the way to do it is start, just look at the topics and see what you like, and then you'll start feeding your way into it, I think. Right, so I haven't read this book myself, but one book that I've been recommended is Will Kamlicker's Contemporary Political Philosophy. Have you read that book before? I have, yeah. In fact, okay, if, if I'm leaning back and seeing if that's one that I've got, yes, that is the, <laughs> that is the copy that I have. Um, in fact, I've got two editions of it, a bigger one and a smaller one. Um, yeah, that is a good place to start. It's... Um, I think if you're already kind of versed in philosophy, you're already used to the language and the way in which people write, then that's a really nice kind of first year undergraduate and above text, um, which wouldn't be too difficult for an A-level student. I think if you if you found that challenging, you can always nudge it down a little bit. You know, there will be the equivalent of, uh, you know, the, the, the dummy's guide to right. philosophy out there, you kind of political philosophy out there somewhere. It doesn't matter where you start, just start. I mean, that's the thing. It doesn't matter wh where you begin, as long as it gets you, you know, the foot in the door and then build up. I still do that today. You know, I, I can't say that just because I've got a master's in this that I, uh, I always go in at the top level. Sometimes I buy the, you know, such and such a guide to the works of, yeah. And then read that before I read the original text, because eh? some people are, some people are just very difficult, and you have to accept that. No, that's 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 entirely true. Uh, again, one quick thing I'll say: is there's nothing about political philosophy on the A level spec, but it, yeah. it can be quite interesting just to look at other aspects of philosophy anyway, just for fun. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. I think that, and there's so much out there, and I think that philosophy is. Um, I think, I mean, if I just think about it, I, I'm sure that I've seen Dan O'Brien. Who, who used to teach at um, Birmingham University, and I think that he also teaches with the OU sometimes and, and stuff like that. He he wrote a book on the philosophy of gardening. You know, I mean, you know, right. you can you can write philosophy about all sorts of stuff, and people are surprised to find that people have written philosophy books about various things. It's there, even if it's not on the spec, there will be something out there that will probably interest you. Um, which is way beyond the spec. Sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's not. It's it's something like the philosophy of gardening. So, I've never heard about the philosophy of gardening before, so that's something I have to Me look Me neither. I've, I, I, I've never read it because I don't have a garden, so I, I, I can't <laughs> reap the full benefits of that. It doesn't seem um, that useful in that case. No, I mean, well, I don't know. I read Descartes and I don't have a soul, so I suppose that doesn't really... <laughs> I don't suppose that makes much of a difference. I suppose that's a bit of a, a fallacy, but never mind. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Okay, so today we're going to be looking at uh, the tripartite view of knowledge, and we're going to be looking at the issues with the tripartite view of knowledge. Yeah. Gittier, his, his examples. So, yeah. do you want to, before we get into the issues, explain what the tripartite view of knowledge actually is? Yeah, of course. Um... The tripartite view of knowledge is, is the three-part view of knowledge. Um, so ultimately, I think the, the best way to think about it, especially if we're discussing, going to be discussing Gettier, is going to be to think about it in terms of uh, necessary and sufficient conditions. So um, simply put, the necessary conditions are the things that need to be the case in order for you to have knowledge. And the sufficient conditions are basically sort of like the the most you need in order for it to be the case. So it's enough to have that to meet those conditions. And um, we'll look at the technical side of that, if you like, in it in a bit. But um, really, the tripartite definition is saying that you need three things. You need to have a belief, which is true, and which you have justification for. Right. And these are also sufficient because if you've got a belief which is true and you have justification for it, you don't need anything else in order to that to count as knowledge. Any times you have those three things, you've definitely got knowledge. 
Right, so you, as you, you mentioned necessary and sufficient conditions, but I quickly yeah. want to explain what, what those are. A necessary condition means that it's required. So S knows P only if the condition is true. Um, so you, the condition must be obtained for S to know P, whereas a sufficient condition uh, means that it, it suffice for S to know P, but it's not necessary. Yeah, and then of course we get um, the, the, the thing that we talk about with the tripartite definition is that you can have a condition or a set of conditions which are necessary and sufficient. So um, with the necessary and sufficient conditions that we're talking about here for knowledge, each individual condition is individually necessary, but uh, none of them are individually sufficient. Only having one of those things doesn't give you knowledge. When you put them all together, then as a collective, they are jointly sufficient for knowledge. So if it's okay with you, we'll quickly go over the three types of knowledge now. Uh, can do, if you like, if that, if that would be helpful. So I'll list them. If you, do you want to give a, ex explain what they each are after I, I just say what they are? Yeah, sure. So propositional, practical, and knowledge by acquisition are the three types of knowledge. Okay. Propositional, yeah. propositional being like, I know that. So an example would be, yeah. I know that my name is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that, the, yeah, that takes the form of a, 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 takes the form of a statement, or can take the form of a, of a statement. Um, it's what sort of the only type of knowledge where you are actually um, proposing a proposing a truth, if you like. Do you want to cover a practical knowledge? Uh, yeah, practical is that knowledge how. Uh, so you know how to do something. So uh, at the moment we are exhibiting that we know how to use the internet or you know how to ride a bike or whatever it might be. Now you can see that's different from, from the previous type of knowledge because we um, you know how to ride a bike without having to be able to say anything about riding a bike, without believing things about riding a bike. Um, and also it's not the kind of thing that can be true it's uh, when you're riding a bike that's not it being true and uh, or it being false it's just not the kind of thing that can be true or false and then the final one is knowledge by acquaintance so an example of that would be I know London and what that means is I'm acquainted with London meaning I know my way around London yeah it's this um, it is this idea of um, you can kind of link it with with meeting people. That's probably quite clumsy the way that phrase. Yeah. There. Um, if you say that you uh, know a place, then it normally means something uh, which isn't necessarily again propositional. It's not something that you have to put into into language to make it true or false. Um, nor is it uh, a, something based upon ability, if you like. It's not your ability to be able to ride a bike. It is, you know, ultimately the fact that uh, you can navigate your way around London, that you, uh, if you're in one place, then you know where another place is in relation to it and so on, which is, which is a very different kind of knowledge to the other two. Right, so the three types of knowledge is knowledge by acquaintance, propositional and practical knowledge. What do you think the next thing we need to start discussing is? Um, I would say the, the key thing is uh, thinking about how it is that Gettier is undermining this, how it is that what Gettier's problem is with uh, the sufficiency of, of those conditions for propositional knowledge. That's the key thing, I think. Right, okay, so again, those are the three types of knowledge, uh, by acquaintance, propositional and practical. But there are three conditions for knowledge, um, if you want to have a justified. But there are three conditions for knowledge, and those conditions are uh, A, uh, the truth condition. Uh, if you have knowledge of something, it has to be true. So, for me to have knowledge of the fact that it is Wednesday, it has to be true that it is Wednesday. Uh, the second one has to be the belief condition. I have to believe that, that, that it is true. So I have to believe it is Wednesday. Uh, for me to, to make a claim that it's Wednesday, uh, for it to be true that I knew that it was Wednesday, I had to believe that it was Wednesday. And the third one is the justification condition. The justification condition being that my belief has to be justified. So I can't have knowledge that it's Wednesday if I believe it's Wednesday and I have no reason for my belief that it's Wednesday. I just wake up with no knowledge of what day it was yesterday and decide that I believe it's Wednesday. 
then otherwise it could be true that it's Wednesday today, and I can believe that it's Wednesday, but it's not true. It feels wrong to say that it's knowledge, because I have no, I've got no justification for my belief that it's Wednesday. Uh, Gettier, however, said the justification condition isn't enough, that, um, and do you want to explain his argument for that? Yeah, um, Gettier's overall argument, so in, in the paper, is justified true belief knowledge. Um, it's about two and a half pages long, and yet you can whittle the argument down into into quite a simple syllogism if you if you wanted to. There's more to it than this, but the the basics of it is really that if justified true beliefs are sufficient for knowledge, then it could never be the case that I had a justified true belief but didn't have knowledge. So that's premise one. And we know that to be the case because that's just what it means to be a sufficient condition for something, really. Right. Um, the second premise is just, however, you can have a justified true belief that isn't knowledge. Therefore, justified true beliefs are not sufficient conditions for knowledge. And that's basically over the space of a couple of pages, um, how the argument works. He's ba he's really just got to convince you of the second premise, because the first one is fairly straightforward. If that's what justified true beliefs, if sorry, if that's what sufficient conditions are, then that's just what it would mean for a justified true belief to be sufficient to count as knowledge. Um, what he then needs to convince you of, though, is that counterexamples are possible. And that's how he actually approaches the the overall criticism, is that there is this counterexample or two counterexamples that show this. Right, yeah, no, he, he had a few different arguments. One of them is known as the Smith and Jones argument. So, should I break that down now? Yeah, you can do, and I, I, I can sort of explain how it uh, how it works for you if you want, if, once, you've, once you've explained it. Is that how you fancy doing it, yeah? Yeah, no, that, uh, that's that's great for me. Yeah, cool. So the Smith and Jones example is as follows. There are two men. Uh, one's called Smith, one's called Jones, and they work at a company. Now, both Smith and Jones have applied for a promotion. So it doesn't matter what, what job it is or anything. Cause the, 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 the important bit is Smith and Jones have both applied for the same position. Uh, Smith's manager takes him, takes him to the back room and says, I'm really sorry, I think we're going to be giving Jones the promotion. So here you can see that Smith has got a justified belief that Jones is going to be getting the promotion, but he's been told that Jones will by the man who's giving out the promotion. Now Smith then goes, uh, sits outside the interview room, uh, and Jones is sat next to him, and he watches as Jones pulls ten coins out of his pocket, starts counting them. Uh, he Smith counts as well, and Smith Smith counts, and he also counts ten coins. So he realises that Jones has got ten coins, and jo Jones puts the coins back in his pocket. So Smith comes up with the belief that the man with 10 coins in his pocket will get the promotion. He's built this off the justified true belief that Jones will get the promotion and the justified true belief that Jones has got 10 coins in his pocket. Now, Smith and Jones both go and do their interviews and it turns out that Smith actually gets the promotion. His boss changed his mind. So he had a justified true belief that the man with 10 coins in his pocket would get the job. It then turns out he, he looks into his own pocket and finds out he's also got 10 coins in his pocket. So by the argument for a justified true belief. He did indeed have a justified true belief, uh, but Gettier argues that it just kind of feels wrong. Uh, it, it doesn't seem like a justified true belief. Well, the way to look at it is if you look at uh, the way he's kind of framing this, is um, he starts by, in the paper, he starts by explaining that there are two points that are going to make this example work. And I think this is kind of ties together the whole Smith Jones thing and makes it more understandable. Um, Cause what we've got here is a story of a man who has a belief about who's going to get the job and a belief about who's going to have 10 coins in their pocket. And he um, forms a belief from that. And that belief turns out to be justified and true but you wouldn't be willing to call it knowledge and there's two reasons for that um according to according to Gettier in this rather bizarre example um that he gives he says first of all 
when we say that something is justified, so I'm justified in believing a particular claim, then it's possible for me to be justified in believing something that, that is in fact false. So I'm sure listeners at this stage will probably already had some kind of a discussion about you know uh, things like Santa Claus and stuff like that you could be raised your whole life to believe in Santa Claus you've seen the evidence you know the carrot disappears in the morning and the, the glass of whiskey or sherry disappears overnight and so on there's presents left behind you know you've met him at uh, you know met him at the local department store and things right um, but that doesn't mean that it's true that Santa Claus exists you've got justification to believe that he exists but not that it's true so the first thing is we can be justified in believing a claim without the claim actually being true. It just means that you've got good reason to believe it, ultimately. Um, the second bit that he tries to tie in is that um, if you've got a justified belief, whatever that belief is, we'll just call it P, and you can deductively um, conclude from P some other belief Q then if P was justified if you were justified in believing P then you're also now justified in believing Q and the reason that from that because is we've used entailment or we've used um, kind of deductive logic to show that if P is true then Q must be true so if I've got a good reason to believe that P is Q, I've also got a good reason to believe that Q is true. It sort of carries the justification with it. Now, if you take these two ideas and put them together, so you take these two simple points about the nature of justification and put them together, you come up with, I suppose, a bit of an awkward situation, which is that I could be justified in believing P even though it's not true. And I could deduce from that that um, a proposition Q, which I would be justified in believing as well, even though P that I got it from wasn't actually true. So I could get a justified belief from a justified false belief. All you then need to do is imagine a situation where my new justified belief Q turns out to be true by accident and there you've got a case of a justified true belief without you being willing to say that it's knowledge yeah yeah is that is that something that may need explaining again or no i think you explained that really well i mean just i you know the way i normally kind of do is think about that think about the logic underneath it and then try and explain the example to to kind of fit with it i suppose yeah yeah one of the things i often find useful when talking with you more than welcome to use this bit if you like um, one of the things that I always find useful when talking about the Gettier examples is to see that they all follow the same pattern. Right. Somebody believes something, we'll call it Proposition P, and they have a good reason to believe Proposition P, and then, as a result of Proposition P, they can logically deduce a further proposition Q, which they will now also automatically have a good reason to believe but the the twist in the story always happens at the end where it turns out that proposition p was false and q turns out to be true by accident and therefore you've got a q is a justified true belief but it's not knowledge because you've i mean there's various ways in which people have looked at this but it's you know you've got the idea that it was derived from something justified but not true um, or that uh, it was just luck that made it true it wasn't that it was actually derived from from anything that would have made it true and so on and so on i think that's a really good way of breaking down his his arguments actually mm. so for example with the 10 coins one proposition b would be him believing that jones would get the job um, he then uses that to deduce that the person with 10 coins in their pocket will get the job. So he has a justified true belief that the person with 10 coins in their pocket will get the job. And it ends up being true. But we don't want to call that knowledge. Is that right? Sort of, yeah. He's um, th The initial, this is where it can get a bit confusing. When you actually look at the original claim that um, 
that Jones, the Smith or Jones, I can never remember which. Oh, it's Smith, isn't it? Yeah. The, the the original belief that Smith has, the original belief that he has is, he forms these two beliefs of who's going to get the job, Jones getting the job, and Jones having ten coins in his pocket, and he puts them together into one proposition so into a into a conjunctive proposition so an an and statement and the and statement that we could call proposition p here is jones is the man who will get the job and jones has 10 coins in his pocket now if i gave that proposition to anybody and said okay here's one proposition Jones is the man who will get the job, and Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. Tell me what else you think is true, just from knowing that single statement. You would say, well, the man who's going to get the job has 10 coins in his pocket. If right. proposition P is true, then that follow-up proposition Q must be true. It's deductive. Yeah. If you accept P, you have to accept Q. So... He seems justified in his claim that Jones is the man who will get the job and Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. That seems like a justified claim. And it only turns out to be false because one of those things is false. So the man who will get the job, one of the bits of the conjunction is false. The, the Jones is the man who will get the job turns out to be false. So when we look at the second part, the man who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket... It turns out to be true because Smith actually gets the job and it turns out, coincidentally, that he has 10 coins in his pocket. So technically that proposition is true, but that proposition is true completely irrelevant of Jones. Yeah. Like it's got nothing to do with Jones whatsoever. And yet it's still how we how we worked it out. It's still where it got its justification from. And we can do this because of those two rules that he sort of sets up at the start about you can be justified in believing something without it being true and if you logically deduce Q from P, you know, if, if P entails Q and P is justified, then Q is justified. Right, yeah, that, that's true. Are there any responses we need to go over? Um, if you're looking at responses to this, I suppose the way that you've got to look at it is that second premise that, that I mentioned earlier, that idea of um, you can have cases of justified true belief that aren't knowledge. And interestingly enough, it's not necessarily that we just have these counterexamples and we say, oh no, I'm happy to say that Smith knew that. That does count as knowledge because that's really difficult to do. Is, yeah. um, instead, what you have to do and this is where it all gets sort of awkward and <laughs> awkward and logicy, I suppose. Is um, you have to sort of say, look, I'm not saying that he's met the conditions, but it, um, Andy has knowledge. I'm saying that he hasn't met the conditions. That's why he doesn't have knowledge. He doesn't have knowledge. Like for example, in this case, he doesn't have knowledge because he doesn't have a justified true belief. Like it just doesn't count. Right. So if you're looking at a guy like Descartes, for example, like, and you say. You know, Smith um, gets told by his boss that Jones is going to get the job and therefore he's justified in believing that. Descartes just goes, no, he's not. Right. He could, he could be being lied to or he might have misheard him and he didn't say Jones. He said something else or, you know, whatever the case may be. That's not an infallible belief. That's That can be doubted. Or if he says, you know, he, he sees that Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. And you kind of think, well, maybe you miscounted. Uh, how do you see 10 coins in someone's pocket? I mean, you know, the, can you see through the pocket? Is he... Um, I mean, there's issues with him looking in his pocket in the first place, but there's, <laughs> you know, one has to, you know, kind of think about how you can accurately count coins through a pocket and so on. This is where he gets more down to the the believability of a situation, I suppose. But I think what... A, a sort of more Cartesian response would be something along the lines of it, you say he's got a justified true belief but not knowledge. I disagree. I think the reason he doesn't have knowledge is because he does not have a justified true belief. That we're not we're using justification in a very loose way to just say um, 
you've got to have a reason for what you believe. Right. And if you take justification to mean more than it's a reason to believe something, but it's a good reason to believe something, and then what you define as good has got some very particular criteria, then it could actually be, because I don't know personally, but it could actually be that you can never really create a Getty A example from that because it's automatically not justified because of the way the examples work. Um, I think Descartes might be a good example of that, that if if what uh, Gettier is talking about is something that he says he's justified in believing, that, that Smith is justified in believing, Descartes would just say he's not justified in believing that, so it stops. And then if he did come up with something that Smith was justified in believing, like some truth about logic or about geometry or something like that, then he would just say, well... That was a true belief. That wasn't a false, unju- a false justified true belief. The whole example breaks down. It doesn't work anymore. Right. So what you're saying kind of if you strengthen what we define justification, strengthen the idea of justification, then you could prevent Getty examples from happening. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you either strengthened it in that sort of Descartes sort of way, or if you just found the right definition of justification I th- then you might be able to block Getty examples in that way the infallibilism one I think definitely stops it, it just stops it dead in its tracks but and I'm sure you'll have other podcasts on this uh, <laughs> maybe that depends upon whether or not you're going to accept infallibilism, it's it's not really much of a, of a cure for the problem if uh, we don't accept the theory out of hand anyway um but that's the way that you've got to approach it, I think. Right. The other response I've heard is if you replace justified true belief with reliably formed true belief. Yeah. Uh, just changing changing the terminology, because reliably formed, you could argue his boss isn't a reliable source in a way. Yeah, I think that's it. I think when, you know, reliability is one of these terms that obviously we use it one way in, in, in philosophy to some extent. And I think that if you talk to... I often think it's interesting talking to social sciences students and science students about this and talk about when they talk about reliability of things. Um, If you're just generally meaning um, that it's got to be the right sort of source for the kind of thing you're talking about, it's got to be um, the appropriate method to form that sort of belief, um, then you could argue that just asking the boss who's going to get the job, when you're one of the candidates is not necessarily <laughs> is not necessarily the best way to get the best answer is it's not a reliable way to know who's going to get a job um likewise counting 10 coins in someone's pocket i mean what's a reliable way of knowing how many coins somebody has got in their pocket well it would mean probably a thorough investigation of that person's pocket um which is you know which he wouldn't be able to have under these circumstances now I know that we're drifting away here, and I think this is one of the things you've got to watch out with Gettier, is that we get more bogged down with the details of the example than the actual underlying logic. Right. I think that's the main thing, that it doesn't matter about Smith and Jones and all that. It's just, hypothetically, if somebody formed a belief in a similar sort of way to the the sort of the logic of it, you know, that they have a justified belief P, which isn't true, they logically that logically entails Q, therefore Q is justified, and then it turns out to be true. Would you count Q as a justified true belief? Um, the example is meant to elucidate those, so it's whether or not when we come up with these responses, we actually think that it's getting to the core of the logic behind what he's trying to say, or whether or not we've just got beef with that example. Right. If if you're calling like whether into, we just go yeah yeah go on sorry go on. sorry yeah if you're calling into question how he counted the ten coins in the pocket, uh, then Getty would just respond by giving you a different example. Yeah, he would just say, well, it's not about counting the coins in his pocket. Then it's the fact that he's I don't know, um, got soup on his tie or something. Right. Right. And well, you maybe... can see he's got you can see he's got soup on his tie, and then you look and oh look, you've got soup on your tie as well. It's not the it's not the coins that's the issue here. <laughs> it's the underlying way in which we form the belief, which is under question. Which is why it's interesting to think about reliabilism because they're just saying 
we just doubt that this whole justification thing is necessarily the the biggest issue. I think that you can have a much more what we call inter, um, externalist account of justification rather than this I need to provide you with reasons for things account of justification and if you can just step out of that and it works the similar in skepticism as well if you can just step out of the whole debate and refuse to take part in it then that kind of avoids the problem right so how do you feel about this are you persuaded by Gettier do you believe what he's saying um I I do think it's a problem. I think that it, it sets up... For me, I've always seen kind of Gettier as one of these wonderful sort of little tests, like, um, like something like Descartes' Evil Demon or something like that, where if you want to see the true metal of something, then apply the Gettier example and see if it can get through. Right. Um, you know, or, or, you know, apply the Evil Demon example and see <laughs> whether or not you can still believe what you believe or, or at least provide your best case for it. I think that it does, because it's so versatile as well, you'll see at the start of the, the paper, if, if anybody reads the, the actual paper itself, it is available online, that he offers three different definitions of knowledge. He offers one from Air and he offers one from Chisholm as well, um, that are all basically the same. They're all basically tripartite structures. And I think what he's done really well, I think Zagzebski mentions it as, this as well, he said that any attempt that you have to just have true belief plus X, whatever that X is, is probably going to run into these problems. And I think what he's done, if even if you disagree with him on certain things, I think what he's done is shown that the conditions for knowledge have to be tied up in the right way. It can't just be that you've got these three things by any means necessary like there's got to be a connection between the justification and the truth and the belief the thing that makes you believe it you know the, the justification has also got to be connected to the thing that makes it true right otherwise otherwise it's just coincidence or, or luck and that's what he's trying to avoid that's what plato's kind of trying to avoid with the tripartite definition is we don't just want lucky beliefs and he's kind of saying wow even the justified true belief side of things can have lucky beliefs right now of course when i first heard the tripartite view of knowledge uh, Gettier's response is something i thought of of course i couldn't formulate it as well as Gettier did but it's just it, it kind of summarizes and explains the problem we all have with the tripartite view of knowledge like the instinctive issue we have um i think the only other thing we need to talk about for the course is Gettier's second example uh, which is the ferrari example if you'd like to discuss that one yeah, sure. So um, he offers another example, and this one's slightly more difficult, but I, I think if you just go with it, you'll see how it works. Using exactly the same structure as before. So Jones believes something which he has justification for, which is that Jones owns a Ford. We'll make that our, our starting proposition. He then manages to logically f work out if you like, that uh, there's another proposition which is which would be the case, which is Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Boston. He then offers two other examples of this. Either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona and so on. And the reason being because all of those logically follow. Now, if you want the logic for that, and this is one of these things where for the, for the sake of time, you'll just have to go with me on this. You'll just have to believe me. Right. Um... When you've got a disjunctive proposition, so a proposition that says something or something, then a proposition of that form is true if one or both of those things is true, and it is false if both of them are false. So if I say A or B, that is true if A is true, or if B is true, or if both A and B are true. But it's false if neither A or B are true. Right. So if I were to say to you, my first proposition is A, and then I say, therefore, A or B, it is not possible for the proposition A to be true and the proposition A or B to be false. It just isn't. Because logic. Yeah. 
So <laughs> this is what I mean. <laughs> Feel free to. This is what I say about building on stuff. Go out and read a book on logic. There's loads of great books on logic out there, but it will explain it. So if you take that to be the case, I could say Jones owns a Ford, and from that, that entails that Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Boston. Because it does. Because if because if Jones owns a Ford is true, then it is impossible for that following statement to be false. Right. Because there will always be the condition that would make it true. So um, it doesn't matter whether Brown is in Boston. It will always be true. So what then happens is it turns out that our original proposition is false, that Jones doesn't own a Ford. He was just borrowing it. And it turns out that Brown was really in Boston. Uh, and the re and that means that the proposition, either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Boston, is true, but for com the completely other reasons than we thought it was. Right. Not because of Jones owning a Ford, but because of Brown being in Boston. And Brown being in Boston was a fact pulled out of midair. He actually says, if I can give you the quote, Smith has another friend, Brown, of whose whereabouts he is totally ignorant. Smith selects three place names quite at random and constructs the following three propositions. So this is like deliberately a ridiculous claim to make, but nonetheless a logically deductively valid one. Right. So if I can give you that as a justified true belief, which I have done, how could you know that either J Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Boston from any of the stuff that I just said? And yet here, we've got a justified true belief that either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Boston. It's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous in a way. Um, Gessier makes a mockery of the argument. Yeah, I think that's it. He's just saying, if that's what you genuinely believe, that justified true beliefs are sufficient for knowledge, you have to say that Smith knows that proposition about Jones and Brown. You have to say that they know it. Now, that's bizarre. That's a really weird thing to say because it's a perfectly logically valid statement to make. Um, but it doesn't mean that uh, you have any knowledge of it at all whatsoever. Exactly. And there's loads of other examples you could use for that. Mm. Some of them even more ridiculous than the example he gives. Um, yeah, it's always fun to make up your own. I think, I, you know, that's a task. That I always say, again, if you want a revision tool to see whether you really understand Gettier, take that formula that I sort of said at the start, you know, which I've repeated a few times, you know, that take an unjustified, uh, sorry, a justified belief, P, deduce something from it, Q, then have it turn out that Q is true and, and P is false and just come up with the most bonkers thing that you can that could work like that. Um, and you get his point. Right, I would say Gettier's examples are quite down to earth in a way. They're not that ridiculous. Um, no, I mean, the job interview one is certainly fairly straightforward. It's an, Like I said, it's an unusual thing to believe. Like, I think it's it's right. weird that... that uh, anybody would sit there and think the man who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket. I mean, he must have been incredibly bored and just <laughs> working through every logical deduction he could make. But again, it's not the detail of the of the example that matters, it's the logic of it. Um, so they are quite down to earth. They're not kind of asking you to think about anything really ridiculous that isn't a point of reference that you could grasp. Because I know that some old philosophers, you know, they... You know, if you're reading ancient Greek philosophy, they're happy to kind of drag in Greek mythology or what was happening politically at the time. And it might be a great example, but only if you're also studying classics. Um, whereas he's talking about people only, you know, going for job interviews and owning cars and stuff, which is which is a nice, simple way of approaching it. It's a fairly timeless example in a way. Yeah, yeah, you would think so. So according to my notes, we've covered everything. Is there anything else you think we need to discuss? No, I think that's it. I think that if you can if you can get the logic behind what he's trying to say, then everything else clicks together. Um, right. That he doesn't just leap in with a counterexample. He's he's got the counterexamples work by a very specific mechanism. Um, but despite all the complexity of the mechanism, the the argument that he's producing is beautifully simple. It is if if. If justified true beliefs are knowledge, if they're sufficient for knowledge, we shouldn't have any counterexamples. We do have counterexamples, <laughs> therefore it's not sufficient. Right. Benjamin, thank you so much for joining me. Um, no problem at all. 
yeah, it's been really, really great. And thank you for what you're doing. It's going to be incredibly useful for students, I imagine. I'd, I'd love to have you on another episode. Uh, and thank you for everyone at home watching along. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thank you all for listening to the Things You Thought You Knew, the A-Level Philosophy Podcast. As I said at the beginning, I'm really sorry there was an upload this week. Uh, and uh, Again, I'm sorry, I had a bit of a sore throat. I've been recording a lot of episodes recently. Um, as you know, summer's coming. I've, I've struggled to find guest stars who want to record during during summer. So I've been trying to get as many as I can bef- recorded beforehand. Uh, the good news that means is I, I hopefully should be recording every week uh, during the summer holidays. So if you want to revise during, or you can catch up when it's ended. Make sure to check out the podcast on Instagram and Facebook at The Things You Thought You Knew. We have a website. Uh, I spent quite a lot of time making it, so I'd really appreciate it if you could check out the website. It's got links to everywhere. You can listen to the website. And it's also got the resources that uh, were made by or contributed to by guest stars. I hope you all have a wonderful week, uh, and thanks again for listening to the podcast. Uh, I really appreciate all of you tuning in every week. Uh, I hope you're finding it useful.